Hey, this is Jay. And this is Chelsea. Welcome to the Shifting Perceptions Podcast. We are bringing you inspiration to live a more creative lifestyle because our favorite people are the ones that choose the path less traveled. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the 21st episode of the Shifting Perceptions Podcast. This week, we got to chat with Welsh astrophysicist Geraint Lewis. I got to exercise parts of my brain that probably haven't been used in 20 years, and you get to listen to all of Jay's dreams come true as he gets to ask his questions about black holes, time travel, and our universe. We move in and out of a realm of science fiction through this incredible interview with our very first astrophysicist. We chatted quantum physics, quantum mechanics, Grant's thoughts on what if this universe and life we know is all just a part of a giant simulation. Grant is gentle and kind with us as we ask him questions like, what does an aha moment look like in the mind of an astrophysicist? And what happens to science when humans are just a naturally biased species? This interview will make your brain hurt, your universe grow, and your creativity burst into directions of patterns and new discovery. I hope you love every second. Stick with it. I know it's heavy at certain parts, but we get a little lighter as the interview goes on. Just a couple quick things before we get into the conversation with Geraint, which is awesome. So awesome. If you haven't done so already, may I please invite you to click subscribe on your podcast player of choice at this moment. And also a couple quick plugs. I'm an artist. I appreciate any and all support or love. You could find me on my website at jalders.com or on Instagram at jalders or any other social media platform. And my wife, Chelsea, is a birth doula. So if you're about to have a baby, thinking about having one, or know someone that is, we are in New Jersey. And you can find her at ohmamasdoulas.com or on social media on Instagram at ohmamasdoulas. And her personal Instagram is at Chelsea Alders. We love connecting with you guys and getting your comments on social media about our episodes and our guests. So please continue to connect with us on any social media platform. If you look us up, Shifting Perceptions Podcast, you will find us and we will reply. Let's jump in. Great. Are we saying it correctly? I don't want to screw it up with our terrible American accent. <laughs> no, no, that, that was excellent. You did better than uh, most actual British people. Oh, oh, perfect. Well, that's good. We actually, I actually Googled it to make sure I was pronouncing it correctly. Did you, uh, did you know it. your, uh, did you know your name means old man in Welsh? Yes, yes, I do. I am a Welshman, so and I'm approaching the old man stage. <laughs> Fair enough. So it's bright and early there right now, right? It's morning for you. Yep. Yep. Nine o'clock. Um. Yeah. It's, it's not a particularly sunny day, but it's going to be warm. It's getting really hot this weekend, but uh, yeah, it's pretty good. That's nice. It's like we're expecting snow right now and it's nighttime, so it's ah, okay. I'd rather be in sunshine. <laughs> I don't mind the snow actually. Oh really? I'm the same way. I like it quite a bit. Yeah. And it never ever ever snows in Sydney. Ever. No. We were actually in Sydney about nine, it's going on nine years ago. It's a beautiful, uh beautiful place. I'm excited to jump into the, this, and uh, we appreciate the opportunity to talk to you, and um, I, I tried to do as much research so I don't sound like a dope, but I'm sure I will. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure you're used to that, though. I, I, look, I love talking about science, so whatever the topic, let's go for it. Yeah, so let's jump in. So I think a good launching off point would be your book, um, A Fortunate Universe, that you did with Luke Barnes. I was looking a little bit into your work, and the idea of fine-tuning seems to be something that you're quite passionate about, which sort of um, is a big topic in the book. The idea of, is is our universe finely tuned for life? Is it God? Is it a multiverse? I would love to hear you kind of explain that so I can understand it better and people listening can understand what the heck we're talking about. Okay. Um, okay, so the... As you mentioned, the topic of the book is uh, is this concept of fine tuning. And, um, you know, when we have our, our laws of physics, our laws of science, um, they're written down in mathematical terms. Um, and what we have is that in the laws of, of science, as we know them, there are these numbers that uh, essentially you can you cannot calculate. You have to ask nature why, you know, what is the value of this particular number? 
So uh, to give you an example, uh, you know, uh, roughly 400 years ago now, Newton gave us his law of gravitation. And we know that that tells us what the force is between two masses. And it depends upon the mass of each object and the distance between them squared. But there's another number in there, which is normally written as capital G, which is known as Newton's gravitational constant. And we need to know how big that number is if we want to do any calculations. If I want to calculate the force between the Earth and the Moon and the Sun and Pluto, etc., you need to know how big G is. And you can't calculate that number. You've got to measure it from nature. Um, and it turns out that these numbers are peppered throughout science. So you, you see it in the strength of the electromagnetic force, the, um, the, the way that atoms interact. There are all these numbers, the constants of nature that we have to ask nature for. And one of the questions that um, ha has been raised over the years is, is are these numbers uh, basically just a property of the universe? Are, you know, are they just something that uh, – is that's the way the universe is and could they have been different so you know could the force of gravity have had a different strength in the universe or could electromagnetism have had a different strength and so that these numbers are peppered around and so you know being scientists we can imagine playing this game of well asking what would the universe be like with a different strength force of gravity or different mass of the electron or you know all these various combinations and what we find is that if you sort of turn the dials such that the, you know, you've got a different set of these fundamental constants, that the universe very rapidly becomes very different to the universe in which we find ourselves. Um, you find that the universe very easily becomes very simplistic or even dead and sterile. And so the question is, um, why do we have these numbers that essentially allow complexity to be in the universe. And that complexity you know, allows molecules to form and from molecules eventually you get, get life. Uh, and so um, you know, th this, this topic has, has had, I won't say a huge amount of interest over the years because lots of scientists don't think about the constants as potentially being different, but it's had growing interest over the years about why we see our universe to have this particular set of numbers. Does that sort of make sense? It does make sense. Yeah, I guess one of the questions I have as an offshoot to what you said is, do you feel like there's some sort of uh, the human element of our egos? Maybe it's just the fact that we're looking at it from a human perspective. Like, does it even matter or is it just the, our interpretation of it? Uh, putting our humans at the center of the hierarchy that, uh, of course, it's you know, fine-tuned for, for us. But in reality, do we really matter in the, in the grand scheme of things? Yeah, so you have to be very careful in this kind of argument. Um, the, the, the question of fine-tuning um, is sometimes referred to as the anthropic argument or the anthropic principle. And it's, a, it's asking the question about, you know, is this universe made for humans? And people get very upset because, you know, um, you don't need humans in the universe. You could have other kinds of life. I mean, if there are no humans on the planet, you'd still have dolphins, etc. Would the dolphin say, is this universe made for dolphins? <laughs> right. The, the, the question really is not whether or not the universe is made for humans. It's, it's why does the universe have the properties that allow complexity to be in the universe? So humans are the result of the fact that we have 92 natural elements and those 92 natural elements can combine in a whole different bunch of ways to form complex molecules and those molecules interact in a very complex way to give you biological entities and those biological bits and pieces com interact in a complex way to give people. So the real question boils back down to why do we live in a universe where we have so many different stable atoms that can join together in so many different ways to give eventually complexity in people. Because I can think of a, a, a universe, I can write down the equations whereby um, that the, the building blocks of atoms, you know, the protons and the neutrons, which sit in the nuclei of atoms, you know, they were formed in the early universe. But if I change the strength of the fundamental forces, I could get the nuclear reactions to work such that there are no protons left in the universe only neutrons. 
And neutrons are the most boring particles that there are in the universe. They don't have any charge, so you can't attract electrons, so they don't form atoms. And if you don't form atoms, you can't form molecules, and therefore you can't get complexity. So if I lived in a universe that was only neutrons, then there's no prospect of complexity. So you don't even have to worry about the question of humans. It's the ability to form any complexity whatsoever. So that's really what fine tuning is about, is, is what allows the universe to have this complexity that results eventually in intelligent life. So rewinding to what you said about how many scientists don't think to question a constant, do you find that in your own research, like, is that something like, I almost feel like that's like a sentence of like, the rebel scientists, like, I'm going to mess with the constants. But if you start to mess with all the constants that we have, like, isn't that a never ending, like a black hole, really, like a never ending process of like, you could change everything? Well, that, that, that's right. I mean, but that's what science is, isn't it? I mean, the um, so, so that, let, let me just clarify slightly, right? So scientists, imagine historians, and right? So there's two kinds of historians. There's the historians that think that the only object of history is to understand what has happened in the past. There are others that like to play what if games. Okay, and so you know that the famous one is, you know, what if the Germans had won World War Two, or what if um, there's a whole bunch of what if st stories that people can play, and then they play out alternative lines of history. Right. right. And this is a right. This, so this is a big sort of uh, area in the science fiction books about what kind of world it would have been if if the slightest change had happened somewhere along the historical timeline. Which is like the mu the multiverse uh, view of things, correct? Uh, that, that's that's yeah that's sort of where we're we're getting to here. So there the, there are there are lots of scientists whose whose day job is to ask the question about well my 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 job is to understand the universe that's around us that I see all this stuff I want to understand you know how does this material interact with that material this do that etc. But there are some physicists that ask what to, can you know in my mind I've sort sort of bigger questions about why the universe has the nature it does. And to do that, you play what if games. And just like the what ifs of history, right? There are There's infinite number of what ifs of history. There are infinite numbers of potentially different universes that we, we want to consider. Um, and so this is what we try to explore is what are all of the potential what if universes there could have been. And as we play around, and it's, it's a very complex thing to do because all aspects of the universe interact in a very complex fashion. As we play around, we find that our universe and universes like ours are like small islands where you get complexity in a sea of other potential universes, um, which do not have the ability to form the complexity that we have around us you know so so some what if universes only last for a, a billionth of a second it's very hard to imagine a universe that lasts that short uh could have any kind of complexity in it other universes expand far too quickly such that you get one proton per billions and billions and billions of cubic light years and it's very hard to imagine in that universe that that proton is going to meet up with another proton and you're going to get complex interactions right so most most universes appear to be dead and sterile so th this then leads to the question of you know um why does our universe look the way it does and that leads to these ideas of well maybe um there are all of these other universes out there they've been realized in this thing called the multiverse that there are this you know, semi-infinite number of other universes, each with different combinations of these constants. And of course, we find ourselves in one in which there is the complexity to allow complex life. But um, that the consequence of that is that there's all these other universes out there which are dead and sterile. So have you ever, in just playing this game of what ifs, like, have you ever just seen a combination of these options that you were like oh my gosh if that happened that would be insane like is there something that's blown your mind as far as playing this game other than just finding dead and sterile you know oh yeah yes yes i mean there are there are plenty of things which are which are kind of interesting um so, so i'll just give you one of the ones that always uh makes my mind twist a little bit so um alchemy 
right? We right. all we all we, we all love the stories of alchemy. We know that even lots of famous scientists dabbled in this notion of can I turn lead into gold? And we now know that you can't do that because um, the fires that you produce that they're chemical reactions. Um, but if you want to tune, turn lead into gold. That's a nuclear reaction. And the energy scales involved are a factor of a 100,000 to a million, right? So you need you know, 100,000 times more energy than you can put into a fire to, um, to, to turn lead into gold. But that's in this universe. Now, the, the, um, the fires are controlled by the electromagnetic force, the nuclear reactions are controlled by the strong force. And they they have these two numbers attached to them that govern the strength of those forces. And so if you mess around with those values, then you can bring, you know, you can make the electromagnetic force stronger, you make the uh, strong force weaker, and eventually they can be of the same kind of strength. And and that would mean that that if you, you lit a fire in that kind of universe, you could get nuclear reactions to occur. I, you know, imagine you're going to bake a cake, you put all your ingredients together, your flour and your milk, etc. You pop it in the oven, you pull it out, what comes out is a lump of lead. rather than. <laughs> so that those kind of universes are even more com- complex than ours. They have the ability for more complexity. And we really don't know if those universes with extra complexity are more, um, you know, life friendly or life inhibiting than the universe the universe in which we inhabit so the, 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 it's just thinking about well i can make the universe have more complexity but what does that do so we're only really starting to scratch the surface in that direction wow so quasi related here so the idea of constants i think so i'm a visual artist so i'll preface the question with that one of the sciencey topics that fascinates me in the visual arts is the i the the idea of the golden ratio being woven throughout nature and the cosmos itself like when you look at a a visualization of like a cosmic web where you look it looks very similar to like neural networks it looks very similar to we saw this uh, documentary where they poured like molten metal down a, a colony of ants it all has oh, yes. like this similar uh mathematical uh fabric uh in plants in human nature in in everything and i was wondering how much the golden ratio uh or I guess related constants are part of your work, or is it just something that's superficially um, interesting and on a mathematical or visual sense? So, so the, the golden ratio itself doesn't, uh, it, it's not one of those sort of numbers that appears. Uh, so let me take one step back and sort of explain this, right? So we, as I mentioned, we have these constants of nature and those constants describe effectively uh, uh, simple interactions, right? So the gravitational force on its on its own is a simple interaction. The electromagnetic force on its own is a simple interaction. And the question is, what happens when you have a process that involves lots and lots of these simple interactions going on? And, and in physics, we call those complex systems because we're very unimaginative. <laughs> and <laughs> what you find is that when you have processes where lots of simple interactions combine to give you a complex output, then some of these geometrical patterns regularly emerge. And as you, as you said, there is a similarity between the picture that you see for the neurons in the brain and the picture that you see for the large scale structure of the universe. They are very, very different processes, one driven by gravity, one essentially driven by electromagnetism. But what's going on in both of those are lots of simple things going on, lots and lots of places, and you end up with this overall kind of network looking structure. We don't really know why those patterns regularly emerge when you do that. I mean, there there are lots of heuristic and hand wavy sort of pictures that people have, but no sort of overriding principle that uh this will turn out with this particular kind of pattern to it so yeah this the the notion of complex physics or complex systems is still a bit of a mystery uh because it's very hard to write down um mathematical rules 
um, derived from combining lots of simple things together together to give you a complex thing. And this is one of the reasons why you know physics is is defined by sets of simple equations that we can deal with, whereas biology isn't because biology is the physics of complex system. Lots of simple things interact in. And, you know, you, you, starting with the physics, it's very hard to predict a B, right? So, you know, it, it's, it, it's, a, it's a smush that we, are, we don't yet understand. So I guess a follow-up to what you just said is I've seen, uh, I've seen articles where they talk about having universes almost simulated through mathematical equations and through coding and through stuff that melts my brain trying to think about, yet you were talking just a few moments ago about how complex and difficult it is to sort of use these constants to predict some of these things. Is there like, is there a, a point where maybe uh, artificial intelligence will enable us to create more involved in depth uh, universe uh, simulations for better words uh, than we're doing now? Uh, yeah. So, so I'll just I'll mention the simulation side of things because I do quite a bit of that, so I can, I, I know how that one works. So, um, as I mentioned, as the we we know how gravity works, um, but but when we want to describe the evolution of matter in the universe, we've got to translate those equations onto a computer, let a computer solve all those little equations, and then when the uh, equations have been solved, we can track the evolution of matter in the universe from the early universe to today. Uh, and we can write down approximations of how matter moves around, but the the result is always more complex than our simple equations allow. So this is one of those complex physics questions, especially when we add lots of additional physics. So when, if we want to add what happens to gas, because most of the matter in the universe is this dark matter that we can't see. Dark matter is relatively simple uh, because it only interacts gravitationally. But if you want to add gas, and gas turns into stars and stars live out their lives and go supernova, et cetera. You've got to add all of those equations. and You can trace all that evolution through. And that normally involves uh, very big computers solving lots and lots of equations for often years to give you the evolution of the universe from early times to today. And what we do is we actually play around with the laws of physics. We can actually set up universes with different laws of physics to the universe we live in or, or potential bits of physics that we haven't fully explored yet. And we generate synthetic universes all the time. And in fact, my, that's what a lot of my students do is they, you know, they generate um, synthetic universes. I would say before breakfast, but most of them don't get up until midday. <laughs> but, um, but yeah, so synthetic universes is one of the big ways that we can understand our universe. The big problem that we have is that what we get out of our simulation is this very complex distribution of stuff, right? It tells us where the matter is, tells us where the stars are, but it's in a very complex form. And then we get s similar but not exactly the same information from our telescopes. And we, at some level, struggle to do detailed comparisons between the two. I mean, we can do simple comparisons we can sort of say well there's this many stars in the real universe and this many stars in the set synthetic universe so that's a good match and there's this many lumps in the real as opposed to synthetic so that matches and the overall sort of network of stuff that looks similar but what we really want to know is where are the the more subtle differences the more subtle similarities and of course we are struck by struck i said we, we are hamstrung at some level by the fact that we are humans and humans have a particular set of algorithms in our head for seeing patterns and matching patterns and we really need to have a more human free way of analyzing these things to find out what it is that's interesting in there that our brain is is not picking up so we're so almost people, restricted because we're too pattern oriented. It, well, you know, humans are very good at seeing patterns in things when patterns aren't there because, you know, that's the way our brain is wired. Yeah. And algorithms sort of the algorithms people are developing see different things. And of course, this is all part of the issue of things like um, the development of self-driving cars. Humans, human minds are, they, uh, I wouldn't say tuned, but they're very good at picking up 
you know, things that move and things that dart around and, and telling the difference between a, a child and a lamppost. Whereas <laughs> algorithms at the moment struggle to do that. Yeah. But they will they will get better because we want them to drive like humans. It's one of the things that we want them to do. Uh, not not like all humans. Some humans are terrible drivers. <laughs> this is true. Um, but what we would like to develop is is a a, a, a a less human approach to analyzing data that d- doesn't bring our, our our biases based upon the way that our brain interprets things. And people are working towards that end. They are developing new methods to classify things and compare things based upon um, the entire artificial intelligence side of things. But it's, it's, an, it's an emerging field in astronomy and astrophysics. It's still not the dominant thing yet, but I think it's going to become bigger. That's like completely fascinating. Well, so I want to ask you a more human question here. So in this field, I feel like there's people that maybe gravitate towards this because they want to be up there in space and understand it hands on. And then there's people that gravitate towards it because of the mathematics. Do you find Mm -hmm. yourself like if you could be in outer space doing research, you would do it? Or do you just prefer the, the grasping the mathematics of it all? Um, look, I, I, I would, I would more than happily go into space. I'd, I'd re- really, uh, I'd really like that experience and to, to be working in space. But I mean, I was, I mean, I was drawn to this air, area by the, the science side. And in fact, many, many scientists, professional scientists I know were not like, um, uh, amateur astronomers when they were children, you know, they're, right. they're, uh, there are not that many stories of professional astronomers that you know who start off with. When I was a child, I used to gaze at the sky. I mean, yeah. I grew up in I grew up in the UK in South Wales. I was lucky if I could see the sky through the clouds. <laughs> so, but I I was I was interested in the the scientific side, the scientific story of the universe, the fact that we could understand things about the universe, etc. What age uh, did you start that? Where, where did that start in your life? Uh, it's like I could, I could imagine you in like a, a university, like just smoking a joint, listening to Pink Floyd, and like looking out, outside and being like, "Dude." <laughs> so, so um, let's see. Let me. Well, look, I, like, like a lot of kids, I was interested in dinosaurs when I was very young. I was interested in the uh, the astronomical universe, as in, as you know, what you could read in books. I decided when I went to university to do physics because I was interested in physics after doing my high school. But, and I tacked on astronomy because I was interested in astronomy, but I thought physics was going to be the, uh, the thing that I would do at the end of the day. Uh, but then I discovered you could, you know, you could forge a sort of research career in, um, in astronomy and I went down that route so it was it was never a goal it was never a target you know and in fact there's again there's lots of professional astronomers I know who are accidental astronomers they were brought into it by understanding physics and understanding that you could bring physics to the universe and thinking oh that is an interesting thing to do so um yeah it's uh, thinking back I'm not 100% sure how I ended up here right it it was <laughs> it, it was it, it was not a follow your dream kind of thing it was more oh here's an opportunity to keep doing something that I enjoy and here I am a number of decades later so i have a question on that so what was your first like major like maybe paper you wrote or thing that you had your major aha like this is the coolest thing i've ever discovered on my own that wasn't taught to you Oh, oh my goodness. That, that, that's a, that's a tough question. Um, I've had a couple of those kind of events over my career. The thing is, is that a lot of science isn't really done in isolation. I have some close co- collaborators that I work with and, you know, I, if I find something interesting, I often talk to them very, very quickly and chat about it. Um, there's there's been a couple of um I, i'm, I'm, I'm str- struggling to pick the ones that i i i can i can describe 
uh, that actually make them sound like they're interesting. <laughs> <laughs> nice. So, so if, uh, uh, back in the 1990s, let's, let's go with this one because I, I like this one because this is working with a bunch of people that I, I still work with. They're, they're really great people. What we were doing, we were looking at a group of stars in the outskirts of our Milky Way galaxy. They're called carbon stars. They have lots of carbon in their atmospheres. And we wanted to use them uh, use their speeds to try and measure the amount of dark matter that is in our Milky Way galaxy. And we were collecting the light from um, one of these stars, and we, we got the spectrum of light. And it turned out it wasn't a star at all. It turned out that it was a, it was a supermassive black hole located you know, billions and billions and billions of light years away. Uh, and so we, we scratched our head over this and we realized that um, that it's very bizarre to see these objects so far off in the universe appearing as bright as stars in our galaxy. So, you know, we twiddled the numbers. And we realized that this object was quite extreme. Um, it was it was intrinsically it had to be very, very bright. So one followed by 15 zeros times the brightness of our sun. Wow. Um, and and so I, I remember that we squiggled the numbers and we we realized that firstly it had to be one of these strange objects known as a gravitational lens. Its light was being magnified by something in between. And I did the lens modeling and I I I, I sort of worked out that intrinsically it still had to be this really bizarre object. And so work, writing down those numbers, again, you know, it, very rarely do you throw your arms in the air and you shout Eureka. You sort of go, oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <okay." laughs> uh, so, so, so that was a cool one. That's amazing. And, That's so cool. And then, and then about, let's see, it was about five years ago now, I was working with a student um, looking at the distribution of these little galaxies called dwarf galaxies neighboring um uh, surrounding the andromeda galaxy which is one of the nearby big galaxies to our own and we had been working through the numbers on how these things are distributed and what we discovered was that they weren't random they were just they were just sort of distributed in this very planar structure that was completely and utterly unexpected and that was a big aha moment i do remember standing in the office with him and we had gone through the numbers we'd drawn lots of pictures and we just went Oh, wow. Well, I think I actually swore a little bit, but I won't do that on your podcast. No, you're totally <laughs> um, welcome to drop F-bombs here. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, and, and yeah, so, so it, it was the feeling then that, yes, this is, this is something interesting. And we got, a, we got a big paper out of that and a, a bit of press around it. Uh, and it's still one of those unexplained results to today causes a bit of controversy. So, so yeah, so they, they, there are, there's a whole range of uh discoveries you make and a whole range of emotions that go with them so a few of them are like really aha and then there's lesser kinds of aha as you go down so do you ever feel just overwhelmed by like the possibilities of i mean i just feel like that would be my first emotional issue working in astrophysics just be like it's never ending like you could be discovering forever like there's no end point here. yeah i was actually curious like do you find that the more discoveries and the more technology do you find that there's less to know or it just does it just keep opening up endless possibilities where it'll never really get to the point where you're like hey i'm running out of stuff to study here <laughs> yeah, well firstly let me just uh you know to quote billy joel here right i mean astrophysics puts bread in my jar so <laughs> I, don't, I, I, don't want, I don't want it to end right yeah. but but um look every time we turn a new telescope to the sky or turn on a new particle physics experiment, et cetera. There are more and more questions. And there are, there are definitely not less questions now than when I started doing um, astronomy and astrophysics back in you know, 1990. We, we know so much more about the universe, but every, kind, every sort of big discovery we make just opens more and more questions. So, so when I was a student, right, we didn't really know what the universe was made of. But now we know that it's, you know, 25 percent dark matter. We still don't know what dark matter is, but it's 75 percent dark energy. And we have less of a clue of what dark energy is. Are those still hypothetical? Are those still theories or have there been actual proof of dark matter and dark energy at this point? Well, it, it, it depends what you mean by proof. OK, so th this is this is where it gets a little bit messy, right? 
we we have our laws of the universe. We can write down our equations. And so we, we know how mass pulls on mass. And we cannot explain virtually any observation in the universe about how things move without there having to be dark matter. So we look at the sun going around the center of our Milky Way galaxy. It goes around at around 220 kilometers per second. It takes roughly 250 million years to go around the galaxy. When we calculate how much gravity there is due to all of the other stars that we see, then there's not enough mass in the stars to hold the sun in that orbit. If it was only the, the, the gravity from the stars, the sun would be exiting the galaxy and disappearing off into the universe. So we need dark matter in our galaxy, but we need dark matter in all the galaxies we can see to explain their motions. And we, can, we need dark matter to explain the motions of galaxies amongst themselves. So either our equations are wrong, right? We've, got, we've gotten gravity wrong somewhere, or we need to put in this dark component. And similarly with dark energy. So dark energy was discovered the, at the end of the 1990s by looking at the expansion of the universe. We have our equations for the uh, cosmology of the universe. And most people expected the universe to be decelerating, slowing down. But these observations that we got at the end of the 1990s and many observations since have showed that the universe is actually accelerating. The question is, given the equations, what do you need to have in those equations to get the universe to accelerate? And you need to put a term in, which is this dark energy term. So, again, we could have gotten all of our cosmological equations wrong, but they seem to work so well. I mean, gravity seems to work so well, et cetera. Hmm. Um, So either there is this substance, dark energy in the universe. Or our equations are wrong. And both of those alternatives are, are equally wonderful because that means there's lots more work to do. Um, but the, the, I guess the prevailing idea is more towards there is this additional energy in the universe. Okay, so, so I have a question on this because I'm just wondering if there's a connection between the empty space of the universe itself, as you're describing, where we are currently using like dark, man- dark energy and dark matter as a possible, most likely suspect scenario. Now, mm-hmm. th- is that related on, let's say, an atomic level or even a quantum level where we are 99 point a bunch of nines empty space where we are fields of energy where protons and neutrons have such huge amounts of space between the center of an atom and the elect- the electrons orbiting it there's so much empty space in an atomic level and a quantum level is that also dark men- dark energy and dark matter or is that something you don't even think of in your field so lots of people think about these things so that it's it's actually a, a very very good question so so let's let's deal with dark matter first so most people if you many astronomers and particle physicists they think dark matter is a particle okay so they think it's something missing from what's known as the standard model of particle physics so it it would be something like the electron but a lot more massive without the charge so it doesn't interact electromagnetically etc so there would be these dark matter particles dotted through the universe. Now, dark energy is something different. They don't think it's a particle, and they think it is related potentially to these fields that we see in the universe, as you mentioned, these quantum fields. Now, we have a minor problem in that on the large scale, uh, the universe is described by Einstein's general theory of relativity, which is the thing that describes how gravity works. On if you look on the small scale, on the atoms, etc., the universe is dominated by quantum mechanics, uh, which is the electromagnetic force, the strong force, and the weak force. And the problem that we have is that the description of uh, gravity in general relativity and the description of forces in, in uh, quantum mechanics, they sort of don't really mesh together very well. Okay, So mathematically, they're quite different beasts. But people think that dark energy, which is inside the equations of general relativity, is somehow related to the quantum fields that describe the universe. So so there there is a thought that that's the case. And what, of course, you've got there is that in terms of quantum mechanics, empty space isn't truly empty. 
what we're talking about is something known as the quantum vacuum. And there's this idea that empty space actually seethes with this energy, which essentially pops in and out of existence. And again, people often think, you know, that that uh, particle physicists make this stuff up after too much uh, time spent in the pub, having a few too many beers. <laughs> but but this this notion that that the empty vacuum of space has energy is actually um, a very important concept in modern physics. So you know one of the great successes is calculating you know the energy levels of the hydrogen atom. Right, this is something that somebody you know students will calculate in their uh, possibly their first year physics class at university. It turns out that the, the the details of the energy levels of the hydrogen atom, you need to take into account that space itself has this energy uh, to get the um, the relationship between the predictions from theory and what we see experimentally to match. So we need to to just acknowledge that space has this energy. So we think that maybe space has this energy and this energy is this stuff that we see as dark energy. The big problem is, is when, when you calculate the amount of energy that you, you have in the vacuum and you compare that to the amount of energy that we have in dark energy, they differ by an immense factor of one followed by around 120 zeros. So the theoretical prediction is just way off from the amount of dark energy that we have in the universe. So there's this there's this real struggle to understand why this this um, this ideal suspect, this quantum vacuum energy, is not the stuff that appears in the equations of of general relativity. So so people have been struggling with this now for you know 20 years about trying to relate the quantum mechanical energy to dark energy, but as of yet we we don't really know. And some people suggest that. The amount of dark energy you get in the universe is one of these things that is a fine-tuned parameter. Because if it, if we did have the natural value of dark energy in the universe, it, it causes the universe to accelerate. And what would have happened is our universe would have been born and would have accelerated so fast that you would have ended up with that situation of one proton per observable universe. Do we, so we see, are lucky. Uh, Geraint, I was wondering, do we see this sort of inflation on... Uh, an atomic or quantum level, or is it theorized that all of us and everything that there is in the universe, in including uh, atoms and quarks, is everything potentially expanding? Uh, no, because essentially what you you end up with is a battle between the forces, right? So the on the small scale, on the scale of an atom, the effect of the expansion of the universe is absolutely negligible. You can just neglect the fact that the universe is expanding. Um, you've you've seen the movie Annie Hall. I haven't. With Woody Allen. Oh, yeah. Oh, uh, well, in that movie, there's a kid having a bit of an existential crisis, worrying about the expansion of the universe, and um, and his mother's basically berating him and pointing out that uh, Brooklyn's not expanding, so he shouldn't worry about the expansion of the universe. Right? <laughs> <laughs> what has the expansion of the universe got to do with Brooklyn? Uh, and that's that's what's happening. I mean the. Uh, Brooklyn on, is on actually the, expanding Bo quite a Brooklyn's bit. Brooklyn's expanding very fast. <laughs> <laughs> Not due to the expansion of the universe, Got it. though. You, you haven't um, seen all the bearded hipsters replicating. Uh, uh, yes, yes. Oh, they, they are everywhere these days. Yes. Um, um, yeah, so so on, on small scales, uh, you know, the other forces just win. Gravity doesn't stand a chance, right? So atoms, etc., the expansion of the universe does not play a part. It's only when you get on the larger scales when the other forces no longer dominate that gravity comes to dominate, which is why we have gravity dominated in the solar system. But then you need to get to the very large scales for this um, dark energy expansion of the universe term to dominate. So, it, yeah, it, it's you don't have to worry about Brooklyn. Um, <laughs> At the moment, but yeah, so it's only on large scales that we have to worry about this accelerated expansion. So when everything really surrounding us as Earth, like it's a fairly predictable mathematical equation that goes into, you know, the everything surrounding us, wouldn't mm -hmm. the future be more predictable than we make it seem like it is? Um, the, so... so 
Who who tells you that the universe? Who, well, what aspects of prediction are you worried about? <laughs> I just mean our planet as a whole. I feel like there's so much focus on it changing and shifting and all of that. Obviously, we're contributing to so much of that. But I mean, yeah. on a bigger scale, shouldn't there be so, more mathematics going into that? Right. So so let's let's look at predictions. There's a there's a, there's a, a lot of predictions that. Um, that we can make that we know will be correct for hundreds of thousands of years to do with the orbits of the planets. We know the orbits, et cetera, so well now that, you know, astronomers make, you know, charts of where the moon is going to be, uh, you know, tomorrow, next week, next year, et cetera, because the orbits are all so predictable and we can put in the effects of, um, of the other planets pulling on things, et cetera. So that, that, that there is a lot of prediction we are limited by two things, and one is – well, I'll say three things. One is chaos, this notion that if you want an infinitely accurate prediction, you need to know the, your situation to infinite accuracy today. Otherwise, rounded errors build up over time, right. and we don't we don't know you know the position and mass and velocity of the Earth to infinite precision. We only know them to a finite amount. So chaos does come into play, but you can beat chaos by continuously updating your predictions by just continuously putting information in that helps beat down the effect of of chaos. The other is unexpected events, right? I mean. We could have in a million years' time that a large mass of something comes into the solar system, and that will will uh, you know disrupt our predictions. So there there are unknowns that we need to deal with in terms of what's going on around us. But for the very long term future of the universe, the, the, I guess the the bigger things are uncertainties in our laws of physics, right? Because there could be Things which are, you know, very small scale effects today that we haven't detected that may come to dominate the universe into the future. So just to give you an example, when the universe was was very young, dark energy was irrelevant It because the, the density of matter was so high that the the effect of dark energy and the accelerated expansion of the universe, they were they were irrelevant. Nobody at the time would have been able to detect them. But as the universe expanded and matter thinned out and the density dropped, then eventually dark energy came to dominate, and it now dominates the universe. Now, we don't know if there is another underlying sort of dark energy kind of field there, which we haven't yet detected the presence of, which will come to dominate in the future universe. So there, there are uncertainties in terms of our laws of physics, in terms of what we know about the universe and how the laws operate, which could affect our very, very long-term predictions. Wow. But but so we, we do think about these things and people do play out the scenarios about, you know, what if the universe has this kind of property that comes into play and that kind of property? Um, it's, you know, how do we get experimental evidence that, that this is likely to go this way or that way? So people do think about it. I have a question about Big Bang Theory. So I was in researching your uh, lectures, trying to sound more intelligent than I am um, <laughs> for this conversation. You had... Uh, stumbled upon this topic, which I'm fascinated about. And I believe it was at the end of your lecture, you were basically theorizing what if the Big Bang and evolution of the, the cosmos up to this point has just been going on for infinity. That makes so much sense to me because when I was a child and I first heard of the Big Bang, the idea of, of there being nothing and then everything made no sense to me. So I would love for you to talk about that. And then something else that I've always just like, Maybe in my my college uh, days, you know, uh, maybe smoking something I shouldn't have been. I, I <laughs> pondered upon the idea of like, is it possible that a black hole or something like it, sucking in light and energy and mass and particles and everything, it condenses at such a point in such a dense matter that at some point it just explodes out the other side to another dimension and that in itself is almost like a, a big bang is that is there any validity to thinking something like that okay so there's a lot of questions there so <laughs> let, let's, let's i've been wondering my whole up. life <laughs> help me out here okay so let's <laughs> let's pick them apart please so let's go let's go with the first one about um the the big bang and the birth of the universe i mean it, 
some astronomers get very caught up in the terminology here, but uh, let's talk about the birth of the universe as it is. So as I mentioned, the cosmological equations, as we write them down, are written in the language of Einstein's general theory of relativity. And you can trace the evolution of the universe from start to today and uh, with a naive reading of the equations, what that says is that the universe was born at this point and at that time, at that point, time and space came into existence and we have the universe that there is around us. And so there is, so, so in that particular picture, there was no before, there was a day without a yesterday. Um, now, as you mentioned, that makes a lot of people very uncomfortable. It is a potential, but it makes a lot of people very uncomfortable that there is this notion that the universe was, there, there was nothing and then the universe was born. If you talk to a lot of people who work in cosmology, they sort of say, well, it makes a lot more sense and, and sense is to do with gut feeling, et cetera, that our universe wasn't actually born from nothing at that point, but is maybe part of essentially an evolutionary sequence of other universes. And there's a whole bunch of ideas. This is the thing. It, it, we run more into the scientific speculation than scientific theory at this point. But there's a whole bunch of ideas that um, that our universe was born from some pre-existing structure from which space and time, ha you know, came, etc. So when you say really ideas, sorry to cut you off, when you say ideas in that sense, just to clarify for people listening, is that like ideas and they come with these theories that are based on physics, like they people come with these ideas that can be proven? Um, most of this is closer to speculation okay. at the moment. So, so the issue is, and, I, and uh, it goes back to something I mentioned earlier on. So the issue is, is that uh, I mentioned that the, the quantum universe and the gravitational universe, they don't play well together. Right. Okay. So it's very hard to write down equations where the quantum forces and the gravitational force are about equal in strength and they have to battle for dominancy. And that was precisely the situation we had at the start of the universe. The universe was extremely dense, extremely hot. Gravity was extremely strong. The other forces were extremely strong. And so that means that at the initial point of the universe, we cannot write down the equations that properly govern how the universe evolved. So there's a window we can't really see through because we can't write down equations and say we, this is explains what happened in this very early stage of the universe. But most people sort of think and think, speculate, you know, dream yeah. that that this indicates that this notion that the universe was born from this infinitely hot, de dense point that we see in the general theory of relativity, that is not the full story. We have to worry about quantum mechanics. So people sort of sort of try to sticky tape the the two ideas together and just say, well, what that could that mean? And they say, well, this could mean that our universe has was born from some event in a previous universe, that something happened in the universe that existed before. And before here is I always put it in air quotes because we don't really know how to define before. Yeah. That led to the birth of our universe. And maybe our universe itself events are occurring in our universe that are leading to universes being born somewhere else. So this all sort of feeds into this sort of messy multiverse evolving universe kind of picture. And, and one of the ideas that people have had is that actually um, maybe violent events in our universe, right, where space and time get really, you know, shaken very vigorously. And you, you do that when a, a giant star dies. So you get these massive explosions known as supernova. In those massive events, space and time gets, gets basically ripped so hard, they form a black hole. And in the formation of that black hole, that creates a universe to be basically budded off from our universe. And it goes off and it has its own existence somewhere else. So, so that, but as I mentioned, this, this is because of this mismatch we've got between, um, between and general relativity and quantum mechanics th these are speculations pipe dreams more than anything else but that people are wondering about these ideas of uh, is our universe just one of an internal sequence of universes born living die born living die etc well so to ask on that and this is just my naivety to this topic but 
has this been something that's been witnessed in a different universe? Like, have we ever been able to calculate that this could happen by seeing it happen elsewhere? No, th- no. So the big problem we have with most of these ideas is that like, it, like the idea of uh, creating a universe from the formation of a black hole, we can see the giant star die. Boom. We can sometimes, you know, see the signature of the resultant black hole. But the formation of the other universe, that takes place inside the black hole, and that's not a place that we can see. So, you know, it's, it's a little bit Wizard of Oz-ish, right? It's, it's all crazy. hidden behind the curtain. So crazy. All right? yeah. yeah, so we don't, we don't know what's going on in there. But, you know, to come back to the, 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 um, another aspect of the question, the question about you know, whether, whether matter that falls into a, a black hole, does that somehow get, you know, I don't know, end up in another universe. And of course, there was that wonderful 1978, 77, 78 movie, The Black Hole by Disney. Yeah. You must have seen that. Yeah. The, 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 the idea there is they fall into a black hole and they come out into another universe. This is not a new idea. It's an idea that's been around for a long, long time. And people still talk about this, that maybe black holes are, are entryways to other universes formed through other events and or even the universe it creates when it, um, buds off another universe. Maybe you can get to it through a black hole, etc. Like a wormhole. But, like a wormhole. That's right. But at the moment, you know, we don't have access to a black hole to test this. And I think you'd have to be very brave to jump into a black hole, <laughs> yeah. hoping yeah. that you know, the result is going to be how Disney imagined. Uh, what, there's, there's what do another... you What do you speculate, though? Obviously, you can't state as a fact, but I'm sure you've spent a lifetime thinking about these sorts of topics. What would you speculate? What happened? Besides oh. the physical aspects of getting melted or ripped it, ripped apart, <laughs> like exploding. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah. Uh, I would be in the realm of science fiction, right? Yeah, I would be okay. in the realm of science fiction. That's fine. But you know, the, there's some some very smart people like Roger Penrose at, at Oxford, who's who's speculated for a long time that uh, if you have a spinning black hole in our universe, it's connected to spinning black holes in other universes due to some mathematical relationships that he gets for the properties of the centers of, the black, of black holes. Again, look, I, I'd, I'd maybe put a $10 bet on there being another universe out there. Uh, but, you know, I wouldn't want to bet my house on it kind of thing. Yeah. So it's, it, it's nice to speculate, but yeah, yeah, it would be very hard to really think through that there would be other universes there because we just re- for, for me, if I can write down the equations and look at the equations and say to myself, ah, this is what it's telling me, um, then that's good. Um, but at the moment, we don't have that. And so you, you're speculating. So where is our closest black hole? The closest big black hole is in the middle of our galaxy, which is about, um, it's about 20,000 light years away. And it's, it's pretty big. It's a few, uh, let me get these numbers right, 100 million times the mass of our sun wow. so it, most most galaxies have big black holes in them and we're we're now we're now seeing this black hole through its influence on objects moving very close to it so we see stars basically orbiting what appears to be nothing and so um there, there's a there's a group at ucla that have been doing this for the last couple of decades tracing the motions of stars so we, we know there's a big black hole in the middle of our galaxy, but there are smaller black holes scattered around, right? And some of them we can see because they're eating material and that material gets very hot and it glows. But there are others probably not that far away, relatively, that we don't see because they're just black and they're not absorbing any matter. So we just don't see any signature. And they're probably just wandering around the galaxy. So some might be relatively close. Wow. But they would be a lot smaller. They would be about the mass of the sun or a couple of times the mass of the sun. That is fascinating. So, okay, so I'm going to bring you back to one of your lectures. And I'll, um, I'm going to ask if you remember that Douglas Adams quote that you gave at uh, one of your lectures, which sort of really impacted me. Do you remember which one I'm referring to? Uh, is that the one about uh, the that's... Some people think it's a, the, this is a bad idea. Let's, I can't remember the exact words, but the one about... I have it written uh, down. I just didn't know if you like had it off the top of your head. But that y- If we ever work out what the purpose or point of this universe is, it will disappear and be replaced by something 
Boom. Yeah, that's the one. It, yeah. Some, yeah, yeah, uh, some, yeah, yeah. It'll be replaced by something even more bizarre and ex- inexplicable. Yes. Uh, so when you said that, I was like, whoa. It, it just mm-hmm. made me immediately think of like simulation theory, which relates back to what you were talking about earlier with literally simulating these universes that your PhD students are working on. Do you, uh-huh. do you, how often do you think about that? What is your thought about simulation theory? Like the idea that we might potentially be in a simulation itself. Like there's no mathematical reason to think that we are in base reality. Is that something that you could touch upon? Yeah. So, so the simulation, uh, simulation hypothesis, simulation idea, et cetera, it, some people immediately just recoil from it. They don't like it. And so they don't even want to, 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 to them, it's obvious that we're not in a simulation, but you ask them what, how it's obvious. And then, you know, you never really get anywhere. To me, it's a possibility, right? That, so the fact that, you know, we are currently um, simulating universes ourselves, right? With our, you know, barely evolved monkey brains, we are able to simulate these big chunks of the universe, very coarse resolution, et cetera. Uh, this is something that we've learned to do over the last few decades. And you can sort of imagine that instead of doing this over decades, imagine that we, ha- we have been working on this over thousands of years or millions of years or billions of years, we've been developing these simulations. And maybe we get to the point where we have the computational power and the mathematical knowledge to simulate universes at ultra fine detail. Then you have to ask yourself, then, well, what would happen to the bits and pieces inside that simulation? You know, could, could you get simulated consciousness going on in little bits and pieces inside your, your simulation? And of course, we, we don't know the answer to that. Um, but of course, there are lots of people who think that simulated consciousness is just around the corner. There are people that dream of moving our own consciousness from, you know, squishy biological beings into synthetic uh, computational environments. And so, yeah, I'm not adverse to the fact that this universe itself might be a simulation. I, I mean, I haven't seen anything that particularly rules that out. Uh, people talk about the fact that you know, that simulations aren't perfect, but our, our universe clearly isn't perfect. And what we tend to do, one of the interesting things, this is, this is one of the things that pushes me more in this direction, is often when you find something in the laws of physics, which seems imperfect, you just r- wrap it all up into your laws of physics. It just becomes part of the laws of physics. So our universe would be a lot simpler if it was um, in terms of the laws of physics, you could have very simple laws of physics that have a lot of symmetry to them, all these kind of things. You'd end up with a very, very boring universe. But there are little bits and, place, bits and pieces where symmetries are broken, as they say. Right? The universe is, is ugly because we don't really know why, but that gives it some of the interesting stuff. And we've, we've wrapped all that up into our laws of physics, and, and maybe that's part of the simulation, right? This is what the person simulating it is doing, is investigating, what if I mess around with this property of the universe or that property of the universe, et cetera? So, so yeah, it is a possibility. I mean, there, there are some, some issues that, that do worry me. Number one, of course, is that if we are a simulation, that firstly, what if the person simulating us gets bored and turns off the simulation <laughs> what if the cleaner knocks out the plug from the computer that's running the simulation uh, that's always a worry and, uh, and another one is is for me is what if what if we're not the intended consequence right what yeah. if we're not the focus of the simulation right maybe we are an unintended part maybe there's something else going on in this simulated universe that the person who simulated the universe is really interested in and we are just some sort of sideline sort of inconsequential bit that's going on you know just a consequence of the the laws they put in there maybe we're so, like a know, speck it, of dust on a pin of a needle of the giant ab- more giant yeah, ab- simulation yeah, right ab- absolutely so yeah there, there, there are lots of things to think about um the you know the question of whether or not we are in a simulation we'd have to sort of understand you know exactly how this simulation is being run um <sighs> It's like a mind-bending topic because when you think about people like Ray Kurzweil talking about artificial intelligence gaining consciousness potentially within a short period of time, it like begs the question like what would that computerized consciousness 
do to prove that it is or is not conscious and how would it potentially find its way out like clearly there would if we are in a simulation there wouldn't be a way that we can figure it out because as that quote stated the more you find out the more that would just kind of reappear in a more inexplicable way yeah so so i have this i mean i have this uh conversation with a number of people about um aspects of artificial intelligence that bother me and number one is that a lot of people think uh, the goal of artificial intelligence is to come up with something that thinks like the human brain. And I'm really worried by that because I don't think the human brain should be seen as the archetype of, of intelligence. <laughs> That's my first thought. <laughs> yeah. Um, and, and so the, the thing is, is if you come up with an intelligence that is not human-like, then how do we judge that intelligence? What does it do to convince us that it's an intelligent thinking thing because you know, we struggle look, we struggle to understand chimpanzees and and dolphins and they're relatively and politicians yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah yeah let's not go down that road <laughs> the, the world's gone mad in terms of politics um the, yeah so we struggle to un- understand what what we define as intelligence in our closest living relatives or even the cl- closest kind of minds that we have on the planet if we develop an intelligence which is just so radically different to ours, this way of thinking is different. How do we how do we judge it? How do we how do we say it's intelligent? How do we judge it's conscious? I mean, is it conscious because it likes soap operas, uh, or I mean, you know, <laughs> the, I think there's a lot that we have yet to answer when it comes to this artificial intelligence kind of question. Um, so, and and, that, and I think we have a similar problem then to understand the motivations or the drives of the of the consciousness in the universe above us that's running this simulation right so yeah I, I think we are we are barely dipping our toes in the water here yeah so i have a question just based on your profession in general is there uh-huh. sort of a has there been so we live in now like this neil degrasse tyson world where there's like almost like this like pop culture around astrophysics and like just everything in science has this been like a good pull towards like more attention towards it or has it become like a weird space because of that um hmm. i see that is an interesting (laughs) question i should tread carefully here and do you have groupies Uh, (laughs) do i I have groupies i definitely do not have groupies um so so, okay i'm going to choose my words carefully um so with with a lot of professional scientists, they don't see that fan boy and girl side of science. Yeah. Okay. The lots of them come into yep. Yeah, so so they will experience like my generation. Lots of people experienced Carl Sagan and and um, Cosmos etc. And so you do get the wonder of the universe, but not a lot of them became fan boys and girls because. To be a real uh, a professional scientist, I should say, takes more than being a fan of science, right? You need, you do need a particular set of skills in terms of mathematics, computation, etc. Right. And having the wonder of the universe is not enough to be a scientist. Now, d- but so don't get me wrong. I, I actually think that that. Um, the more outreach there is about the science of the universe and what we know about the universe, the better. I think it is a very good thing that people know that we are finding out about the universe, especially seeing that, you know, a lot of it is taxpayers' money. And I, I you know, I would like them to think that we are spending their money and learning about the universe. Right. I do worry slightly that part of the the um, the outreach side misses the the grunt and the grind that goes into doing science, right? So you know there might be a lot of people that sort of say, "Oh, I, I saw Neil deGrasse Tyson when I was when I was ten years old, and therefore I decided to become an astronomer." And then they discover that mathematics is really not their thing. Yeah. Um, and so it it take it takes more. And I I actually wish there was a little bit more of this. Uh, what you need to do science as part of science outreach. And so um, it, it has its positives and its negatives. 
It's fascinating because I think he's sort of like the, um, I mean, he's simplifying it for our generation so that we can appreciate it more. But then that's what I was wondering is like, there is there that other side that it's oversimplified, basically? Yes, I think I, I think I think the the aspect of doing science is is not does not come through and we see this i guess with our with our students in that they come in and they might have that more dreamy view of of science and that more you know i'm going to win a nobel prize kind of thing right. and then you know it, it when it get it gets into the the fact that it, it at some level is hard work right it takes sure. it takes a lot of work to, to right. think and write down ideas and process them and compare to observations before you get to your eureka moments uh get somewhat lost but how you sort of wind that into the outreach story without boring people i don't know i mean i guess it's like a lot of things when you you you, you see um you see any profession you know, you get to see the, the wow factor of that profession, but not probably a lot of the grind that goes into that profession in the, in the background. That's probably a really good thing. Otherwise, we wouldn't have very many um, policemen or lawyers or musicians or anything for that matter, <laughs> right? Like, Ab- Absolutely. I look at, look, yes, yes, it's good to be sold a dream, but I think um, a dose of reality as well in understanding how that dream is achieved is important. Yeah. So I think that the arts is a good example of that because – When I was young, I saw artists doing things that pulled me in, and obviously I had no idea on the other side of it the amount of of work. And coming at it from the angle of um, an artist again, a a big uh, physical, spiritual, mental state for me is like the state of flow. That's a big thing for athletes. I was wondering, is that state of flow where time sort of like vanishes and ideas just come to you? and you feel completely inspired is that part of your work or is it much more like left brain analytically metric based stuff that you're working on or do you have like moments where you're just hanging out with your buds or you're in the shower and you're like oh my god and like these ideas just take you over so that that is that again that's a tough question because it it's very hard for me to think about my thought processes um i i have definitely had um wow moments where I have had realizations I have had them when I was in the shower you do get um you do get like oh oh, that's that's the why that looks like that moments um but yeah it's 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 hard so so I I, let let me put it this way it it's not a nine-to-five job being a, a research scientist right at some level it becomes uh all uh, I wouldn't say all consuming, but it's always there swishing around in the back of your mind. Uh, and I think it can be difficult to full, fully, absolutely and utterly switch off from your day job and, and go off and do something else. And so sometimes, you know, you, you know, you have a problem, you call it a day, you can, something's ticking over in your mind. You could be sitting on the train, listening to a podcast or something, and then ping, something comes into your mind without you really thinking about it. So I think for a lot of scientists, it, it, that stuff just c- continues to swirl in the background and sometimes comes to the, 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 the fore and, and you have, have those kind of insights and ideas. But it's not always like that. I said it's, it, it's very hard to describe. It's so interesting to me because it's actually an exact parallel. And like, obviously, your brain is working on like very deep and intellectual stuff. But Jay actually like when he's painting and then tries to leave painting like if he's been painting for six seven hours straight like we'll be driving and he's still working out the problems to, like yeah. everything looks like a painting to him I'm like can we turn it off and it's not possible. But then like it's like I guess what I was reaching to with the question it's like but then when I am painting there are moments and unfortunately they don't last as long as I wish they would but there's these moments where like I feel like my brush is doing the work for me and I could not make a mistake if I tried. And of course, shortly thereafter, I fall on my face and screw up. But I feel like it's those magical moments that keep me charging towards the idea. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So, I mean, some of the things I have uh, along those lines is I can be thinking of a, a result uh, and a way to get to that result. And I keep it's, it's hard to describe how one thinks about maths. 
yeah. you know, right? But, you know, you can I sort of picture things going from one thing to another. And again, it's, it's similar. You sort of think it's all happening by itself, but often you often end up in a heap. So I, I can see there's lots of similarities. I, I, I mean, I, I'm assuming most human minds are relatively similar. Uh, and even though, you know, there's this issue between the differences between the arts and, and the sciences, the, the notion of creativity in both must have similar processes behind it and even if i said painting as opposed to thinking mathematically there must be similar kind of ways that it swishes around in your mind mm. but yeah for me i i've i've never really thought that hard about how i think so for me it's just a lot more things just sit there and then either the answer comes or it doesn't I always picture, did you ever see a beautiful mind? That's what I picture where the, the numbers are floating yes. to the solution. They just appear in yeah. front of you. <laughs> yeah, yes. So, so, so they, I mean, I, I know some, I have met mathematicians who do that. They sit, they essentially sit there looking like they're in a trance yeah. Yeah. and then they just go, ah, and they've got the answer. But, you know, you, you, you learn how to think about things. You learn how to. Um, like w when I work with bits of data uh, or simulations or something, you learn how to get all that into your mind and how how you should be picking that apart and analyzing it. And so, you know, a lot of it is done in your brain without having to write everything down. Um, but yeah, I, I'm not good at understanding these thought process things. Well, have you created like a system for yourself? Because you can't retain, I mean, the amount of information and learning that you've done throughout your entire career. Like, do you have systems that you've created for yourself? So you're like, oh, I can get back to this, this way. Like, is there a way that you work that has really been successful for you? Uh, I had a conversation like this with one of my students yesterday who asked me about what my, my online data storage approach was and I said I don't have one. Oh my god. I have a I have a book and I have a memory and I I you know I was try I was for, for the student I was trying to recall a web page that I last visited probably 4 years ago and I knew that there was a, a a person's name attached to it and eventually it came to me kind of thing. So so I think memory for for me is a big part of it. I mean my my big problem is that much of my memory is taken up with um lyrics from 1980s music um <laughs> what bands yeah. oh um british bands of course okay. um yes yeah, uh, lots of david bowie lyrics etc nice. green Thanks. yeah um so yeah i don't really know i don't know for me there are i i i, I would not say i've got a good memory i'm terrible with people's faces terrible with people's names remembering events with people but lyrics and remembering bits of information that I've picked up, um, that, that all sits in there somewhere. Okay. I, have, I have a question about something I was um, watching you talk about or hearing you talk about when I was doing some research before the interview. You were talking about how life itself, one of its aspects is that it processes energy and that there's links between energy and flows of information. And when I heard that, um, that conversation, it got me thinking about the vibration within on a quantum level, for instance, and if it's on a quantum level, obviously it's on a cosmos, a cosmological level. And is that vibration potentially a sign that the universe itself has a consciousness that we're unaware of and we are just part of it? See, that's, that's a, a that's a, a big question. Well, that's well, why I'm asking you. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you have a well, big a brain, Gray. <laughs> <laughs> there's a lot of aspects in there. So, so, so the the, the notion of energy uh, and energy powering intelligence. I think that's that's an important one, right? I mean, clearly, uh, you need energy to think, right? You know, you you, you just uh, you know stop stop eating for a day and see how well your your brain ticks over. But but exactly how thinking occurs in, in something like a brain and consciousness occurs in something like a brain and trying to extrapolate that to something that's not a brain, I think we just do not know how to do. I mean, I, I actually think we don't even know how to define consciousness in our own brain, let alone asking questions like, is the universe conscious? Right? Because I mean, you know, what is what is consciousness? There's a thousand different tests of consciousness and like all these things that are exceptions that prove the rule. So I, I would say that, um, you know, science would not have 
an answer to that kind of question because we do not really know what we're defining. Uh, is it is we, it easier to ask if there's some sort of collective universe life? Like, I'm just kind of curious what, in your opinion, makes particles in a rock, those those quantum particles that are vibrating that make us see a rock, even though it's 99.99999% empty space, that vibration itself, is is that potentially life, consciousness, or some word that I'm not, that's not coming to my mind? Only if you have a have a particular definition of what consciousness and life is, I think. I think it would be so to most physicists that energy in the shaking of the atoms, etc. That's just energy that arrived there from heat, motion, etc. It's just random energy. It doesn't do anything coherent. Uh, it doesn't. Uh, it, it it's not a way of of thinking it's not a way of processing energy etc so i said to most physicists they, you would they would just say that's not what i would consider intelligence but just just as a complete aside do, do you know um there was a science fiction writer in britain called nigel neal he wrote the quatermass stories probably not big in america yeah i haven't heard of it but okay so he he made a, a little tv series a tv show back in the 1970s called the stone tape whereby that material substances, stones, recorded sounds. They processed information, right? And, and this sound, it was released, and how, how people interpreted ghosts, etc. Right. All part of a sci-fi story. So, so that sort of leans more towards the kind of thing that you're talking about, that, that this inanimate object is somehow storing information and processing and releasing information. And I think most physicists would say that it's just – random fluctuations of energy in an object it's not something that i would um i would define as life and consciousness and intelligence so the information or the vibration itself could be information but that information might just be creating the mass that we we see visibly potentially yeah yeah i mean the, the thing is i mean you can store information on a hard drive would you say that a hard drive is alive is it consciousness I guess as much as a rock. <laughs> as, yeah. So, you know, so if you change your definition, then then you could. But uh, said so this is where you run into the the messiness of these definitions, right? We, we struggle to define what life is, let alone intelligence and everything else. Um, so it's it's a bit of a minefield. Well, it's also you we come right back to that topic of like, do humans look for patterns and all of this where it's their isn't any that's interesting yeah yes exactly exactly uh and i said you you have to be very careful we are very good at fooling ourselves into yeah. seeing things that aren't there right so um the, the science tries to be separate to that we have to remember the science is done by people um but yeah we have to take this thing into account that human brains are biased uh, biased in a particular way. So speaking of things that aren't potentially there, I would love your opinion on some hot topics that everyone loves to talk about. So time time travel, do you have an opinion? Time travel. Ah, I love time travel. In fact, I mean, one of my favorite books is I was going to say, time, we're actually time talking time to you. I think you're in Sydney now currently, right? <laughs> yes, and I so, think I'm So I, you're, I'm tom you're tomorrow. We're actually in the I past, am. so... <laughs> I know it's really freaky. Um, we, we should we should set up some sort of um, some scheme where I can get you the results of uh, games that are going to be played, and we can put some bets right? on. Right? Yes. Yeah. Um. So so look, time travel. Time travel is an interesting one. Time travel into the future we know is is possible, right? Because firstly, we're already we're, doing it. Yeah, right now. <laughs> and and we also know that we can we can change the rates of relative passage of time through traveling in the universe or being in particular places. And the big question is, of course, is time travel into the past. And, you know, the, the laws of physics don't rule it out, that, that you could bend space and time in such a way that you get time travel into the past. The big question we have is whether or not that it could be ever be physically realized. And at the moment, we don't know. We really don't know. Um, lots of people think it can't be. But it, it's not ruled out at the moment. And I would like to think that it might be possible in the future. Um, but, um, yeah, unknown at the moment. Because time itself is not linear, per se. So do you have an – like, is, could that be done theoretically, speculatively, Star Trek, 
what you know uh <laughs> could that be done through like in the future in a machine or more of like a meditation you know get in this zen state and you boop you just go somewhere else like what what would your your speculative dream be that that potentially could happen someday well, as a scientist, it would be the, a, a physical thing, right? So, so for me, to make time travel happen, you've got to bend space and time. To bend space and time, you need to have a lot of energy in particular places and configurations. So that would require some sort of machine. So it would be a physical time travel device. The, so um, as I said, I, I, I'm not saying it's, it's definitely possible, but it's not ruled out to the moment. All right. So Fair enough. <laughs> <laughs> We're counting on you. Let's do this. <laughs> are there any questions that are uh, keeping you awake still at night? What what's your um what's your version of equals MC squared that you hope to uh leave planet Earth leaving behind? Um well, the the the, the things that are currently keep it, keeping me up at night are the fact that it's coming up to grant deadline right in time here. So I'm having to focus on grant writing, which occupies a huge amount of time. And I do have some science ideas bubbling along in the background. Um, I would like to think that maybe my legacy has not yet been written. Every scientist still hopes that they've got something as profound as E equals MC squared hidden in them somewhere. Uh, I haven't found it yet, but I would like to, I, I said, I have some ideas that I, I swish around. Uh, everybody's looking for that that big discovery, but uh, yeah, at the moment, um, I'm not sure. I'm really not sure. So mm -hmm. I, uh, with a bit more work, hopefully, I will get that true eureka moment. <laughs> well, so we have a couple last questions, but I did want to ask because you touched upon like listening to podcasts. What are some of the like really good science podcasts you're currently listening to? Ooh, um, I'm going to be really cheeky here and tell uh, you that I don't really listen to science podcasts. Oh, I love it. Okay. Uh, yeah. so, so are you just listening to Queen all day long? Is that? Is no, that no, 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 so, so, <laughs> no. So, no. <laughs> <laughs> so, so podcast wise, I, I, I actually listen to economics. All right. Because, because, because that was a huge area of my life that I, I avoided, I, I, don't, I don't come from a particularly wealthy background, et cetera, and economics just freaked me out. And then you know, I got to my, my 30s and thought, I should probably try and understand how the world works. <laughs> so a lot of my focus has been on understanding uh, economics from a, a household to a global level. And I'm intrigued by it because a lot of it is driven by a lot of mathematics that I didn't know it was driven by. So, yeah. I, you know, for, for me, it's... it's um, uh, it's been an eye opener, That's especially cool. with all the robo advisors and the ETFs coming out now. It's so mathematically algorithmic dri uh, that, driven. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. I mean, for me, the eye opener was, uh, and uh, so in Australia, you have you're auto enrolled into a pension scheme when you start work. So I was put into this pension scheme when I was thirty or something, and I ignored it. I didn't know what was going on. But then, when you get into your forties, you sort of think to yourself, "Hey, hang on." All this money is going into this thing, and I I have no idea what it is. So I, you know, I I decided to um, try and understand that world because otherwise I would be heading towards retirement without no notion of how any of this money thing really works. So you're involved in investing, or just understand the economics of the world? I I now I'm involved in investing. I was not for a long long time, but I I am I am trying to. Uh, trying to educate myself and get on top of things. That's awesome. Um, so one last question we ask every one of our guests is just, if I have to plop you back in your childhood kitchen. Back in time. Back in time. <laughs> what's in the time. first thing you would think of? My childhood kitchen. Mm -hmm. um, oh, that. First thing I would think of. That's a really hard question. Um, <laughs> we stumped an astrophysicist. Oh, I love it. That's yeah. going to be on my resume. <laughs> well, I mean, there are so many childhood memories that, uh, that that come flooding back, right? So I'll say, I'll say, okay, for childhood kitchen, the thing I remember the most is that I grew up in South Wales, um, in in Britain, uh, mm -hmm. which is a, a, a Climate wise, it's not the best place in the world. Um, and I remember that we have a particular kind of fireplace 
called um it was called a rayburn i'm not sure what what it would be called in america but it was like an enclosed uh you could have a fire on one side you have an oven on the other you have a hot plate on the top okay yeah Uh, I, i just remember that and it's warmth because it would would be going and my, I always remember my parents would always be brewing tea on top of the hot plate etc so like that would exactly be exactly the... what I picture in south wales just so you know <laughs> 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 so 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 and, and it would be the kind of place that um in in wales you make a particular kind of of stew called cow and it's the same as like stew all over the world right you just put everything you've got left over in there and you boil it for <laughs> yeah, a day kitchen right. sink, um, yeah yeah so and I, I so i'd remember that sort of being there as well so i think that would be the kind of thing that would ping into mind that's awesome fair enough this was amazing Geraint, so, thank you so much we want to tell people oh. where they can find you what are the best ways to reach out to you um uh so i'm on twitter at cosmic underscore horizons and I, I'd be more than happy if anyone has any questions to do with anything we've spoken about or anything about the universe to post them. I always enjoy talking about um, physics, cosmology, the universe, etc. Oh, so great. we will put we, we will um, add everything to the show notes as well. Um, also, your uh, book, A Fortunate Universe, we should give another plug to other uh, other projects that we should um, tell people about. Um. We actually, we actually, Luke and I have another book uh, in preparation. It's not 100% in the can yet, but it should be shortly. So there will be another book on cosmology, a different aspect of cosmology, appearing uh, early 2020. Ooh, cool! Uh, awesome. and, and it's the tentative title is the Cosmic Revolutionaries Handbook. Ooh. So, um. If you're interested in that and you want to talk about it at another point, once we once we've, you know, the the ink is dry, uh, then uh, I'd be happy to talk about it. Awesome! Yeah, Exciting. come back on. We love it. This was amazing. Thanks for keeping it like you know dummy proof for me. I was, I was all in. This was really was great. great. Great questions. Thank you. This yeah. was really fantastic. Thank, Thank you. I just you. Uh, I could talk forever. I love these topics. I'm a complete <laughs> novice, but I'm I'm so fascinated, and I'm 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 now your fanboy. Yeah, <laughs> groupies now. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you, Garain. Have a good one. Okay, talk to you soon. Right. Bye. Chelsea, is your mind melted? Yeah, I mean, I'm done. Like, <laughs> and then even just trying to re-listen, I'm done. It's like the most exhausting interview I've ever done in my life. I thoroughly loved it. You I were, know. I like... mean, I loved it. I really did love it. It's just like it was hard for my brain. It was one of those interviews where you either came out of it feeling so moronically stupid or you feel like you got a little bit smarter. I'm I not... felt like I got smarter. I felt like my universe really expanded very, very rapidly during the conversation. Yeah, I really, I keep thinking about the parts where we were talking about like the connectivity between the quantum world and the cosmological world, like the, the the dark matter and the dark energy and the interactions of the various forces that just like blows my mind off. So you're going to ask me to keep asking my brain to do this throughout this commentary <laughs> Sorry. too? Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I do. I agree. I think that that's actually the coolest part is going big to small, big to small, big to small and, and realizing that it's all affecting each other. I think that's always the part that is mind boggling to me is like the it's like the butterfly effect thing of like each change that we can like simulate could change like could cause the end of a universe. Which yeah. is just wild. I thought it was also pretty interesting how he didn't really start out as like that kid with the telescope. I know that I was really that was the one question I wanted to get out of him. Yeah, it's like my one thing is I'm like, I've heard that before that it's more like um, like loving math and numbers. And then it goes big from there. But yeah, the kid with the telescope thing, it doesn't happen. Yeah, there's like so many like subsects of these various studies that I don't think I really thought about very much. Like you just consider in your head, someone that studies cosmology as the same as someone that maybe studies another aspect of space and there there's so many different parts of it and it was really interesting to see how he focuses on the idea of fine-tuning and the idea of a multiverse versus like a god let's say and i I, we probably i probably could have drilled him a little bit more for his like answer on that but what's the point right like yeah and it's all an opinion at this point too so i mean it's not like he's going to give us the answers to the universe no but I could have like pride for yeah. his specific answer. I guess no, I'll have I mean, to dive into his book a little bit deeper. Yeah. Well, so I mean, 
I hope we didn't lose. I that's why I was saying stick with it because as you get about halfway through, it's like okay. I, I don't think it was like now. deep. I don't think we're capable. We can't give ourselves right. enough credit. We're not capable. No, but I mean, where he deep. was just talking was yeah. like yeah, and this is like big on my, my, on my brain that's for sure. <laughs> i slept well that night i feel like you put uh really uh put to good use all these like nerdy books that i've read over the years it was cool to like it was almost like uh when i was a kid i had these like uh choose your own adventure books like yeah. with the dragons those nerdy books and I it was kind of too. like yeah. it to me it felt like a uh choose your own adventure ted talk yeah where you watch this guy talk and you're like wait a minute what do you I mean let's questions. yeah let's change yeah. the topic so I really enjoyed that, and I hope you guys loved it also. Yeah, no, this was – I hope you enjoyed every minute, no matter what level of astrophysics you understand. <laughs> <laughs> I hope your uh, perceptions are shifted. Yes. Join us next week. We have another – we actually have a bunch of really great ones coming up that we uh, might tease through social media, but we have about four or five – on deck. Sitting in the bucket right now, waiting to release that are just incredible yeah, and such one, various topics. One brilliant person after another right now. So enjoy. thanks, guys. We hope you love that episode. Um, if you did love it and could give us some love on iTunes, that would be amazing. You can leave a review and we will give you a shout out at some point on this podcast. Also, if you guys can follow us on social media, we would love to hear from you. We are on pretty much every social media platform at Shifting Perceptions podcast which is the same as our website shiftingperceptionspodcast.com we look and reply to all comments so please share with your friends tag us we appreciate all the love and don't forget that all of our guests also see all these comments so i'm sure if you want to just have a space you can reach out these are the places to do it um we also want to give some love to our amazing photographer that has done all of our photos so far Kevin Rigby. Kevin Rigby. Um, his website is Wavelight Studio LLC.com. Dot com. And also our really good friend John Harvey, who did the music for our podcast. You can find him at Instagram at Harvey Wallbanger. So that's our uh, little rolling credits. We will be back next week.